So in uh, researching you know, where we use tin, pure tin in the modern world, um, one of the most common uses that you might run into in your everyday world is drinking wine, actually. So depending on how much you spend on your bottle of wine, there's really only three or four types of materials that make up the jacket that covers the cork on the top of a bottle of wine. Those are either plastic or this kind of weird leaded aluminum thing. It's, it's metal. Or if you, if you spend maybe about 20 bucks on your bottle of wine, it'll be pure tin. Um, and actually there's all kinds of YouTube videos on how you can collect those and melt them down and get a bunch of tin if you want from your, from your wine bottle wrappers. But you gotta be spending enough money on your wine. Okay, so the last metal that we're gonna get into in the realm of um, base metals is lead. So lead has a similar fate to tin. We used to use it for all kinds of stuff and we still use it, um, but nowhere near um, the volume that we used before. So you can make an argument that lead is, is making a comeback. So mineral form, this is the mineral galena, which is lead sulfide. It shares a chemical formula with channel four, right? Um, PBS, our, our local um, PBS station. But PB is lead and S is sulfur, right? So lead sulfide or galena. And galena is this really, Kind of, it's a little bit of a famous mineral in a sense because it's so silvery and it has some really cool characteristics. You can see over here, this is a piece of galena. Um, also important to Idaho, right? So if you've spent any time in the Sun Valley area and you drive north, there's Galena Summit, that's what you could drive up and over. Um, there's Galena Lodge, which is a really good place to go mountain biking in the summer, cross country skiing in the winter. It's my plug for Galena Lodge. Yeah, though, and those are places that we were historically mining sulfides, in, in particular bulk sulfides, right? So there's a lot of mining history up in that part of the state, and um, lead is one of the things that they were mining. So as far as uses of lead, well, lead, lead's got a couple of things going for it. It's really heavy, and it has some interesting electrical um, capabilities. It also is uh, used to block radiation, right? So as little alpha, beta, and gamma particles are being emitted from radioactive things, they can't pass through lead because of some of its chemical um, components, or because of some of its chemical characteristics. I actually took a trip over to the nuclear reactor out at, at ISU. They have a small reactor there they mostly use for medical research. And there's just lead bricks piled up like walls right, to prevent any of that radiation. But you can see batteries, right? So I, I mentioned the lead is kind of having a comeback. Um, lead is important, an important component in controlling how electrons move and how batteries work without really getting into battery technology. Um, but you can see, you know, if you pop open your car battery, it's what's called a lead acid battery. So there's a lot of lead in it. And if you've ever carried a car battery, you know that, right? They're very heavy because they've got a lot of lead in them. Um, lead has some problems, right? So lead can lead to all sorts of physiological problems, brain development, things like that. Um, you know, lead pipes that we used to make pipes out of lead, that's obviously been in the news for the last, you know, three or four or five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Um, so lead contamination in water can cause sickness. Um, people using lead shot in their shotguns for bird hunting and, and things like that. That's then introducing lead into the environment, which can cause similar problems. Um, but for the environment rather than can people living in cities. We used to use it in gasoline as an additive, right? But now we have unleaded gas. Um, paint, we used to put lead in paint um, because it made the paint itself heavier and it kind of covered really well. I, had, I used to paint houses you know, back a long time ago and I worked with an old guy and he always talked about lead paint. He said lead paint is the best paint you could ever use. It's wonderful, um, but it's outlawed, of course. Um, it has a lot of problems to go along with it. Um, tinsel, Christmas tree tinsel, right? That was a lit originally lead. It was really heavy, it would hang nicely. Um, but mostly when we think about lead in the modern world, its uses are um, primary uses for batteries and secondary, I would say, for you know, protecting from radiation, right? When you go to the, get an x-ray, you get a lead vest. So with, with ferro alloys, with ferro alloys, and that's the next group of scarce metals that we're gonna talk about. Remember, we've got base metals, ferro alloys, 
precious metals and specialties. So we're on the second one. Um, in this case, there's really not a lot to talk about. I mean, that's not true. There's tons to talk about, but I just kind of wanted to highlight a couple of things um, in the ferroid alloy world, and we'll look at some shiny pictures of rocks and move on. Um, we'll get to the precious metals next. So if you remember earlier in the video, we had tin and copper forming an alloy that was bronze. Here, we're gonna do that with iron, right? Um, so thinking back to human history, we have the Bronze Age, and then next up, we have the Iron Age, right? Once we figure out how to do some stuff with iron. Um, iron by itself is fairly brittle. Um, you know, wrought iron fences and cast iron skillets. It's pretty much that. Um, and if you take your cast iron skillet and hit it against something hard, it's gonna shatter, right? So iron by itself is really brittle. Um, it's not very good for anything structural, right? It's a break. Um, but we can change that. And that's what we're all about um, with ferro alloys. So what we do is we add things to that iron in very specific recipes to create steel. And steel is much different than iron, although iron is the primary ingredient in steel. Um, Iron's like the flour in the cake mix, right? Like that's the most important part, but you have to add other things to make it a nice cake. When we think about steel, it turns out there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kinds of steel for very specific uses. Um, so we're just gonna touch on a couple of these ferro alloys, um, some of the more commonly used ones and talk about what they, what they do. So to make steel, we start with iron. We actually add carbon, which is not a metal, so we're not gonna talk about it here. Carbon's easy to come by. Um, but the two kind of primary ingredients in steel are iron and carbon, and then we sprinkle some other things in like magic dust. Um, that's what we're gonna talk about as the ferro alloys. So the first one we're gonna talk about, you can see here, it's our first picture, picture of a shiny rock. This one's really shiny. Um, and this is a mineral known as chromium, um, which comes from chromite. Chromite the, um, is the ore. When we add chromium to our iron mixture, right, our carbon iron mixture, Chromium, we can actually get up to 10% of the total. And what happens is it has, it, it, it creates an incredible resistance to corrosion. So when we have stainless steel, um, that's up to 10% chromium. Again, some shiny, metal-y looking rocks. Uh, this is a metal known as vanadium. Vanadium is a metal that when used as an alloy, increases what we call the tensile strength of the steel. So that's under tension, like if you wanna make cables or something, even the range of a half a percent, um, you mix a little vanadium in there and your steel will be stronger under tension. Um, so again, like a high tension power line. Right? Continuing on, the next one this is a little slug of a metal um, known as nickel, um, which again comes from its own ore, right? So getting to nickel, we're kind of skipping some of that. It adds the malleability, makes it softer in a sense. I mean, it's still not really all that soft. Um, and then similar to chromium, it actually adds corrosion resistance. So if we had a mixture of stainless steel, which was, you know, 10% chromium, we might also find that it's maybe five or 6% nickel as well, right? To kind of get the stainless to do the job that we want it to do. The next shiny rock, molybdenum, or molly as most people call it. They're talking about putting a molly mine up near um, Idaho City. Boise River, if you're really kind of following Idaho politics. Molly does a couple of things. Of the, of the metals, it actually has the sixth highest melting point, right? So it, when we make steel with molybdenum as an additive, it can actually um, add significant strength to steel and tools that we use for cutting, right? So when you want hardened or, or really strong steel, adding molybdenum can actually make it stronger than some of the other examples that we've seen before. Cobalt, shiny mineral number six, maybe? Maybe we're on six. Again, it adds corrosion resistance, so another thing that you'd throw in the mix for stainless. So cobalt, in addition, is used in pigments, like cobalt blue. We do use it in batteries and um, in some cases for cancer treatment. So it actually has some of its own uses um, beyond the steel world. Then the last one we're gonna talk about is tungsten. So you can see here, this is um, mineral tungsten. It, tungsten's got a lot going for it. So it has 
the highest melting point, the highest tensile strength, and also the lowest coefficient of expansion related to heat. So that means it, it adds strength at high temperatures. It um, doesn't change shape when it does get hot. Um, so tungsten carbide, right? So tungsten carbide steel is one of the hardest kind of man-made materials. It actually has a hardness similar to diamond. If you know anyone who does any machining work, right? Like your tools that are used for cutting other metals are tungsten carbide, right? That's a standard um, alloy to use for drilling and cutting and machining purposes. Really hard stuff. So in addition to kind of what we were talking about, there's a, there's a whole kind of subcategory of what we call super alloys, um, and almost all of those use tungsten. Um, okay, so that wraps up our kind of thinking about steel and iron um, in the category of scarce metals, where we did base metals, where we did ferroalloy. Then now we're gonna move on to precious metals and then specialty.